Okay, let's dive in. So what are squads that we're looking at in this showcase? Uh, so squads are small groups of people working on specific, discrete solutions to shared problems. So we're gonna walk through um, several examples of our current squads and what they've been up to. And who can join a squad? Well, anyone who's interested in contributing, whether you're a dev, architect, data scientist, BA, subject matter expert, et cetera, how you join, you, all you need to do is go to the project page for these squads, which is listed uh, throughout this slide deck here, which we'll share in the chat as well. Um, and you, then you'll be able to see uh, how, how to get involved with that squad from their project page. Teams are a little different from squads. These are groups of individuals who are regularly working on a specific ongoing activity that supports our community work rather than a particular problem that we're trying to solve. So for example, our project management team, our QA support team, our documentation team, these are kind of longitudinally ongoing teams and we'll hear from them today as well. Community support for teams. Well, I guess this slide is outdated now, um, given uh, all the wonderful fellows that have now joined the team. Um, but we do have the following people who provide community support for the squads and the team. All right, let's dive in. So some guidelines before we start our squad showcase. So for presenters, uh, remember to respect time. We've got about five to 10 minutes, so 10 minutes max per squad or team. And uh, questions, we used to try to do these at the end, but to be honest, if you have a question that comes up throughout the, these presentations, please just put it in the chat and we'll try to answer it right there. Uh, presenters, your goal is to help us all see the big picture, help us understand why what you're working on is useful and how people can start using it. And finally, use visuals. We want this to be a, a showcase of pictures, screenshots, demos, and recordings. And if you're an attendee today and not a presenter, Awesome, uh, share the love, use the uh, emoticons at the bottom um, to praise the work that excites you and listen closely and ask your questions in the chat. We would love to hear your questions, but also if there was something you thought was cool, please speak up and share that in the chat. That would be really helpful. And if you see anything where you're like, huh, I don't think that that's the best approach to something or wow, uh, I would really love to be involved with this. Please reach out to the squad or the team I know that they are always looking to hear from other people, so this is not meant to be a closed echo chamber. And again, questions, post them in the Zoom chat. All right, let's get started with the OCL for OpenMRS squad. So what is the o OCL, for o OCL, uh, OCL for OpenMRS squad? Um, so they're working on an interface that your clinical content people, whether they're a BA or another non-technical role, an interface that they can use. No more starting your dictionary or concept management from scratch. But let's have a look at what they've prepared for us today. Concept management, does it have to be so painful? That's the question that our OCL for OpenMRS squad has been working on at OpenMRS. And as you can see, there are quite a few of us from different organizations working together to solve the problem at OpenMRS. Do any of these quotes sound familiar? Setting up concepts costs dev time. It blocks our deployments. I wish that our BAs and other non-technical people could set up concepts. We had to start our dictionary from scratch at new sites. We just learned that another organization created almost exactly the same form as we did. We duplicated work. like there's some audio issues. How long ago did that start? 30 seconds. 90 seconds. Oh dear, okay. No, 30, 30. I don't know, yeah. 
60 seconds, oh, yeah, something like that. But they're noting the time. Yeah, it, I, I think it was the third card. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, stop sharing and, and then reshare. Was it about the right spot? No, before that, it was, I think, the third, like in the middle. So I just learned that organization be created almost exactly the same. Okay, folks, I think that my computer is having technical difficulties. Uh, I'm assuming, Todd, that you can hear me right now. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm just going to rejoin the chat here. Okay, great. Okay, let's give this another try. Thanks everyone for bearing with us. We had to have something go wrong. All right, let's share the sound. And let's go back to where we were. And other workarounds just to be able to share forms and concepts across our sites. And we have a standard set of concepts that most of our sites use, but we just wish it were faster to use and adopt these shared sets across our different sites. Well, introducing the OCL for OpenMRS web app, this user-friendly front-end user interface allows non-technical people like business analysts to manage concepts and work with their team members on them, specifically designed for OpenMRS use cases. These are the common problems that we're solving. Designed for non-technical staff, you can reuse your previous work. There are no more migration scripts needed for content. You can import in moments. You can see the public work done by other organizations, and you can use trusted sources to quickly pull together a trusted dictionary. Let's take a closer look. Imagine you have a new site, but you want to reuse a dictionary you've already made, but make some tweaks. We make that possible to copy dictionary work you've already done in the user interface. Imagine you've heard that another program is similar to yours and you're wondering how their concepts are set up. This tool makes it possible for you to see the publicized work of other organizations also using OpenMRS. Imagine you want to see existing concepts or use those concepts from a trusted source. This tool also makes it possible for you to pull together concepts from shared and trusted sources. And imagine you want to add concepts to your EMR in as painless a fashion as possible. You can now import your concepts in just mere moments using the subscription or Open Concept Lab module in OpenMRS. And finally, imagine collaborating with your team. Imagine asking your colleague in another country, hey, can you help me with this dictionary for our new site and making it as easy as adding them to a project you're collaborating on in the tool. Well, let's take an even closer look. And if you'd like more information, Doctors Without Borders has been working uh, on using this tool in a recent implementation in Bangladesh. Let's have a look. Right now, I've logged into OCL for OpenMRS, and you can see right now I'm looking at the dictionaries that I personally manage. However, I can also see dictionaries that are being managed in organizations and groups that I'm a part of. I can also see any dictionary that has been made public. So for example, if I were interested in the Bangladesh dictionary that MSF had put together, I can simply search for it and there it is. I can have a look at the concepts that were used in that implementation. And I might even want to copy or reuse uh, their work. 
Now, let's say that um, I would like to work on a particular example here. I want to work on a COVID immunization dictionary. So I've already set up a dictionary that me and my team can collaborate on, but perhaps I'm not so familiar with this tool quite yet. And I've got a spreadsheet where I've been tracking some concepts that I'd like us to use in our dictionary, but I'm not really sure what to do next. But I know that my colleague Saruchi is very familiar with this web application. So I'm gonna add her to my organization that's managing our COVID concepts. So I'm just going to look up my COVID organization and I'm going to go ahead and add Saruchi. Saruchi is now a member of my organization and that means that she will be able to go in and edit our shared dictionary. So I'm now going to hand it over to Saruchi to explain what happens next. Thanks, Grace, for adding me into the organization. Hello, everyone. This is Suruchi. As I have been added to organization, now I can make changes to the dictionary under this org, OpenMRS COVID Squad. So let me check for the dictionary. I can view this dictionary. Now I'm going to add one concept from the existing source. My preferred source is CIL. I can even change the source but I'm using CIL. Let me add vaccination reaction. I think it's added. Yeah, it's added. So now if I want to add few more concepts, then I can add in bulk. My organization has prepared some sets of CIL code, which I can paste it over here and add concept. After it's completed, it's shown in progress notification. Yeah, I can view these concepts has been added. I can see this from here inside the dictionary. We can see some 33 concepts has been added. So now if I want to create a custom concept, I can create from here, it's a diagnosis concept. So I'm adding something like Immunizations. Now this concept has been created and added to dictionary. So after adding concepts in dictionary, I'm creating a new version of this dictionary to be added in OpenMRS. So this is the third one I'm creating so I'm just giving the ID and description in order to make some action I need to release the dictionary I need to release this version so after copying the subscription URL I can paste it over open MRS over here and save changes now I'm going to import it from the subscription server After it's loaded, I can view the concept if it's added or not from here. Let me check. Yeah, I can see the vaccine related concept which I had added over here. Now the concept has been successfully added to OpenMRS. If I want to create a new dictionary of the same concepts, then I do not need to create it from the scratch. Rather, I can make a copy of the dictionary from here. So this is the copy of COVID immunization. I can write it uh, at sort code. Well, I can view a new dictionary copy of COVID immunization with the same number of concepts and mapping. 
So this is the new dictionary which I have just created and I can view the dictionary over here which I can use in next implementation. Thanks so much. Okay, thanks so much, Saruchi and the OCL for Open MRS squad. So uh, as promised, if anyone would like to see more information uh, about this, this is the case study that <clears throat> MSF put together walking through and they even have videos baked into this slide deck. And the link to that is just here in the slides, which I'll share here in the chat now. Thanks, everyone. All right. Um, so I think I need to confirm the speaker for this one. So I'll just move on to the analytics engine squad right now. So who is presenting for the analytics engine squad? I think that's Cliff. Yes, uh, sure. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, Cliff, do you want me to share my screen? Share and... my screen? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Just a minute. Hello. My audible? Yes, we can Hello. hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, welcome everyone. And uh, I'm going to give a presentation about analytics engine. Uh, what are you up to? And uh, what is uh, analytics engine and uh, what trying to do? Well, basically, it's a uh, out of the box shell. Uh, solution for open MRS, as you realize, uh, it's mainly working to improve open MRS uh, data usage, mainly in reporting and, uh, and uh, some quick decision supporting. So, um, and, uh, make it easier for, make it easier to drill down our patient level data. Oh, I think uh, we might have just lost Cliff due to network uh, issues. Is there anyone else from the analytics engine squad who could uh, take over for the moment? Or could we come back to you? Um, Alan, do you want to present since you also created the demo? Um, sure. Uh, could you, uh, thank you, Bashir, and thank you, Bless. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you very well. Yes, could you please share the presentation? Sure. So thank you, Bruce. So right now we're trying to solve um, analytics needs uh, and it comes across indicator definition uh, custom reports generation as well as any form of analytics. And we, are, we want to create a pipeline, a data pipeline that will enable anyone uh, from within uh, the ecosystem to perform analytics, whether data scientists, whether MD officer, or anyone. Next slide, please. So some of the problems you're trying to solve is storage complexity. As we understand right now, the uh, data stored on PNMRS is ki kind of uh, structured in such a way that you have patient in one table, uh, orbs in one table, and within orbs, you might find nested orbs and encounters in another table. So we're trying to improve how we store our data sets that when you query them, it's much easier. And you're also trying to solve difficulty in transforming data, as well as uh, pipeline maintenance, uh, as well as scaling uh, workloads with increased data. So for example, you might have a situation in the next two years or five years, you're having that uh, your MySQL database is not able to handle some of the reporting needs that you want. 
So we are trying to create uh, a data warehouse where you, you can quickly pull in data and perform analytics, regardless of the amount of data in your open MRS database. And right now, we have, so far, we have three implementers working on this and testing. Uh, APAC is leading in testing, as well as we have ITech, which who, ITech and PIH who, who will come in and also uh, continue testing. We are also seeking more contributors. Uh, the, if we can have more implementers who can test this out, it will be better in terms of it will be able to scale to any kind of problems. Next slide, please. So the big picture here is we are trying to come up with a solution that covers both batch or bulk mode as well as a streaming mode. What do, you, what do I mean by streaming mode? So uh, we are trying to come up with a solution that will be able to capture new events or new records as it is being entered with the EMR, such that you'll be able to uh, get that particular record in your analytics warehouse. For bulk mode, uh, during the first day of uh, exporting, we'll be able to use this uh, sub-pipeline to basically export all the data elements. And once it's in the data warehouse, you can do dash data dashboarding, you can do rough reporting, and you can perform any form of interactive queries very fast and efficiently. Next slide. So right now we are uh, trying to deploy Ampat as the first implementers, and this will help us solve uh, some of the problems that might come up. And uh, after that, we are going to now scale to other implementers. The basic idea here is if it can run at AMPA uh, with such a big data base, it will definitely run on other sites with uh, big database as well as uh, small databases. So right now we are trying to uh, finalize on some of the pending tickets and we can proceed in deploying. Next slide. So we have a small demo for you, uh, please play. In this portion of the presentation, we are going to have a brief demo on the analytics engine pipeline orchestration. The analytics engine pipeline constitutes of three main components, that is extraction E, transformation T, and loading L, also known as ETL. In our approach, the batch and streaming pipeline covers both extraction and loading, while the indicator calculation pipeline covers the transformation bit. As a starting point, we are going to start with batch and streaming mode orchestration using Docker Compose. At the background, we do have both MySQL and OpenMRS ref up running. So we are going to point our pipeline to these instances. First, you'll need to clone the OpenMRS Fire Analytics Engine code base, which contains the Docker Compose files. These Docker Compose files uh, contain several containers and we are particularly interested with only the batch and the streaming mode. We don't need the atom based mode approach for this demo. So we are going to configure a bunch of parameters including OpenMRS based URL, uh, username and password, target parallelism, uh, batch size and other um, uh, parameters. Same with the streaming mode, we're going to configure uh, the OpenMRS URL, uh, OpenMRS username and password, and other configuration. Remember, we're going to run this pipeline in parallel. So once you configure both the batch and streaming mode, you're going to run the convention docker compose command. And it's going to take a few minutes to run. And you, you can be able also to use your 
Docker desktop app to see the CPU usage, memory usage, and disk usage. This I found that very useful. And once the batch mode completes, it's going to terminate and it will give you some summary results such as the amount of time taken and the total number of resources generated. As you can see, we see encounters, obser observations, as well as patients. Next, we are going to look at indicator calculation and orchestration, and it roughly follows the same approach. Under the same Docker folder, you're going to find a file called indicator calculation compose.yaml which contains the uh, specification of the indicator calculation logic. And some of the parameters you might need to configure is the path to the already generated uh, resources, as well as the output and uh, the indicator path to the entry point. Uh, you might have your own custom indicator calculation uh, uh, Python and you're going to point it there. Just like the previous one, you're going to use uh, the docker compose command and please remember to pass in the build option. This will ensure that the indicator logic is picked whenever you change it. And it's going to take a few minutes to seconds depending on the size of your dataset. And as usual, you can be able to monitor the CPU usage as well as uh, the memory usage. Also, the logs is going to give you some information regarding the overall process of the indicator calculation. And at the end, you're going to get a nice summary indicating whether the process completed or not. For example, you're going to get the number of records generated. Once the entire process completes, you're going to get an output CSV file containing the results of your indicator calculation. And depending on how you define your indicators, it's going to be disaggregated by age, gender, and any other parameters defined. And this is going to include counts as well as ratio or proportions. In this so because uh, we've ran out of time, I just want to thank everyone who participated uh, in coming up with this pipeline, designing and implementing, as well as our partners and implementers. Thank you, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, Cliff. Thank you, Alan. Really, I think this is the same demo, so we'll keep, we'll keep going here. In this course. portion of Okay, there we go. All right, and on a related note, let's now hear from the Peeler or Patient Level Indicator Reporting Squad. Uh, thank you, Chris. Can I share my screen? Oh, you you would want to, to do that? Okay. Oh, cool. go ahead. Oh, sure, thank you. Yeah, hello everyone. Can can am I audible enough? Yes, we can hear you well. Ah, oh, sure, that's great. Yeah, um, yeah, um, Moses and um, part of the developers on the PLIR squad. This is basically patient level indicator reporting, and basically this project um, is a proof of concept that supports patient patient level reporting. Uh, within a functional health information exchange system. So, and uh, basically this project complements solutions currently development under the analytics engine squad and fire squad and uh, the Intel of Bamuni uh, PLR team and other teams like the PIPFA team. Yep, um, just a, a brief overview about the, what we are doing, a high level architecture. Um, 
uh, basically patient level uh, data is extracted from OpenMRS using the analytics engine and um, exported to a shared health record. In this case, we are using Capify server through OpenHIM. So we use OpenHIM to track transaction and integrate different um, uh, point of care EMR systems. So the idea is that um, this could support multiple OpenMRS instances at different levels. And uh, as long as they can be able to export it through a single centralized shared health record, shared health record. And um, basically, uh, indicator calculation is done at the shared health record. I mean, data existing in the shared health record. Uh, using uh, a SQL engine, uh, thanks to the Happy Fire team that uh, integrated that SQL engine in that is, that is Happy Fire, I think version 5.30 of. And um, basically, this project uh, focused on the calculation of TXPVL's indicator as a proof of concept, which is basically uh, the percentage of at patients with a suppressed viral load. Um, yeah, basically, problems we are addressing is that how do we get data out of OpenMRS to an external shared health record? Then how do we send that data to OpenHIM and a Happy Fire server, which is a shared health record, which so has all our patient level data? And then improvements, which improvements can be bent to the Fire 2 module to make it more efficient? Um, basically, those are the problems we are trying to solve. Actually, that's why uh, we've been complementing solutions uh, under development by the analytics team. So we've been part of the development of the analytics engine and the Fire 2 module. Uh, some of the updates probably since the last time we presented is uh, we've been able to define uh, uh, major resources and collect the resources. Basically, uh, the, the situ engine calculates uh, indicators based on the defined uh, Fire major resources, which major resource um, references a library that contains the actual calculation logic. So as I said, primarily we've been focusing on the calculation of TXPVL calculation of TXPVL syndicate as a proof of concept. And I've been able to contribute to the analytics engine for um, exporting uh, patient level data in stream mode, I mean, in a real time. And then um, we've been able to uh, dockerize the entire PLR setup, uh, which anyone can easily spin up with just a single command. I mean, this is entirely pre-configured and uh, dockerized, so it's easy to, to test out. And uh, the next focus for this quarter is just to, to create a, a testing and validation framework uh, to test all the components that we've been able to work on. And um, basically this repository contains basically all the, sorry, all the components we've been able to work on. So I'm going to present a small demo. And in this demo, I, I, mean, I assume I already spin up all the instances and this is very easy. You just need just a small command like run and everything is spin up and pre-configured. So, this is the repository here. So I'm going to play this simple demo, basically demonstrating how patient level data is extracted, extracted from OpenMRS through OpenHIM to a shared health record. And then uh, the calculation of the TXPVL syndicator in real time. Yeah, using an integrated SQL engine in Happy Fire. So I'm going to play the demo. Hello everyone, I'm Moses, and I'm demonstrating about the PLAR pipeline, which contributes to an integrated approach that supports patient level reporting using a standard based HIE architecture framework. And this is a proof of concept, which supports the calculation of the TXPVLS indicator, which indicator represents the percentage of ad patients with a suppressed viral load that is results less than a thousand copies. Yeah, that was copies per mills. This is my open MRS instance, which is the data source. 
this is my open him instance which is going to act as the middleware component to track all the requests and transactions and this is my happy fire server which is the shared health record to store all the patient level data in fire format and this is a simple widget to visualize the major report from happy fire i'm also running the Basium stream pipeline, which will listen to all data that is added into OpenMRS and push it to Happy Fire through OpenHIM. I'm trying to query Happy Fire, so make sure I have no any patient. Ah, uh, is that? Is the audio, uh, can, can you listen to the audio? Yes, yes, we can hear it, or I can hear it fine. Okay. At the moment, I don't have any data in my shared health record, so I, I don't have any result for the indicator. I'm going to add a patient in OpenMRS. And I'll skip the other values, not relevant for this part. After my patient is added in OpenMRS, the pipeline will listen to that change and export that data to the shared health record through OpenHIM. I can see OpenHIM tracks the transaction and I'll query my happy fire server to check whether my patient has been persisted. I can see there is a patient record. Now I'll proceed to my widget and query the indicator. At the moment, I still have no result for the indicator because the patient that has been persisted does not have any viral load data. So I'll go back to OpenMRS and capture an observation value for the patient, a very low value. I'll give it I'll give him a, a suppressed value, which is less than a thousand. So my observation still will be exported by my my analytics pipeline. So on querying the Results again, I can see that I at least I have some values in my indicator. I'm also going to try to add another patient and give them an observation value that is above 1000. I'll give the patient a viral load above 1,000. And I go back to my widget to query updated results. So I can see now my results are updated. So I have two patients. One has a suppressed value and the other doesn't have so. My major score is 50%. Uh, yeah, I think because of time, I can stop there. But this, that, that was just a proof of concept. And of course, it can always be improved upon. Yeah, that's, uh, I think, what I had to share, at least uh, about the updates uh, for the PLA project. Uh, thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Moses. That's really great to see that coming together. And thanks for giving us such a visual, clear demonstration as well. Yeah, thank you. 
All right, I think next up on a on, speaking of data exchange, we will now hear from the one and only fire squad. Ian, would you like to share your screen? Yes, I, I would. Let me see. I keep can I'm just gonna try and present this. Does can people still see my screen? Yes, looks perfect. Okay, great. I so I, I'm here to represent the fire squad. You've heard, you've seen a little bit of a demonstration of some of the stuff we've been sort of supporting some of the back end for. All right, our our main goal is to add support for fire, which is a uh, HL7 standard. It stands for Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. It's a little bit of a mouthful, hence the uh, acronym. I'm pretty sure that this. I'm pretty sure it was named that way just so you get an acronym that sounds like fire. Um, and we, we're attempting to provide uh, fire support for OpenMRS so that we can inter so that we can integrate uh, with other with other systems, essentially as e as easily as possible. Um, yeah. So these are some of the this slide lists some of the things that we've uh, talked about in OpenMRS meetings in the past. We have set we've used Fire to connect OpenMRS with OpenELIS 2.0, so that we can exchange orders and results. I, the iTech team is using is using Fire to support uh, querying and a master patient index, which is part of the uh, health information exchange infrastructure that they're setting up. Uh, they're also they're also using it to create a shared health re record, which allows which allows taking data from OpenMRS, uploading it to a shared health record. And then being able to export that shared health record, that shared health record as a report that's then visible back in the OpenMRS instance, which, which means that we have sort of continuity of care documents that can follow patients around, uh, which is kind of nifty. And of course, we are support we're supporting uh, many of the micro, much of the micro front end work as the sort of as the sort of API for getting for getting the data there. Now a lot of a lot of this stuff is a lot of this stuff is really cool and really and, and you know I mean it's allowing us to do some cool things. But I wanted to talk about a a diff today. I wanted to talk about a sort of different stream of work we've been doing, which is to support a, a, a to support something called Smart on Fire. Smart on Fire. Smart on Fire is a is a. a, a API built on top of Fire that uh, is set up to allow that is set up to allow application external applications to access data that's stored in an e, in an EMR. Um, so you can see there's a there's a smart app gallery with all sorts of different apps created, and this is a screenshot of what we'll get to in the demo. The sort of support that we have for this uh, smart on smart on Fire adds to Fire. Uh, some authentication and authorization concepts. I based on the OAuth two based on the OAuth two spec. I so which you know which is a well supported spec and allows us to do some really cool some really cool things. It I mean it's essentially a very it's essentially a very simple uh, API. This is the demonstrate. This is the uh, diagram of how this is supposed to work, where it sends a, it sends a request to an EHR. It gets back a result, a response from the EHR that tell, the an app sends a request to an EHR. It gets back a response that tells the app where to go for all the authorization. It sends something to the authorization to an authorization server. The authorization server either allows or denies the application to access it, and once it does, it can then talk to the EHR and get some real-world data. So at this point, I'm going to try and switch over to a bit of a live demo of this. Um, so we've set up this uh, we've set up this instance of OpenMRS with the, with a uh, with both the Fire module and another small module we. We've built that supports the smart protocol in particular. 
Uh, we also have an instance of Keycloak here, which is an open, an open source OAuth2 server that we've added some customizations to so that it will support authenticating against the OpenMRS user database. And so that it will support the smart on fire flow, which has some modif some slight changes to how OAuth2 usually works. So I'm just, I, I'm just gonna, oh, of course this would happen right when I'm trying to demonstrate this. Okay. <laughs> So it's um, it's redirecting correctly for me, or it's logging it in is. correctly for me. Yeah. Do you, Do you want to? Can you maybe uh, run the quick demo then? <laughs> if you don't, if you stop sharing screen, I can try it. Yep. Something else might probably break, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where is the stop share? There we go. Okay, let me just close out of some things. Ian, do you still want to continue your talking, and I can do this? Yeah, I, I, I can. I can still talk. So, uh, what what we're going to demonstrate is a uh, is an example is an example smart on fire application. It's really basic, but what's cool about this is that this smart on fire application is actually an example that was built by Cerner to support their e EHR. And uh, we're going to show that this app can also that this app can also run against OpenMRS, which is kind of the promise of Fire that uh, you know we can we can have data in a format that other people will understand how to how to consume it, how to do something useful with it. So you can see here that we've added a new icon for smart apps. This is just a you know, this was just to get a quick way of working with this. And we've added a, uh, an, an app for our smart on, smart on Fire app that you can launch from here if you want to go ahead and do that. And now we've actually reached our app, which sends us to the, which I uh, reached out to our server and sent us to the Keycloak thing. So could you log in here, Peter? So we log into Keycloak with, What's the, what is the login? It should be the usual one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Perfect. And now, now as part of the smart on fire flow, when we're log, when we're logging in, uh, the app request, the app wants to do something with a particular patient and that's metadata that it included in the request. So after we've logged into Keycloak, it sends us into this view in OpenMRS to allow us to select the patient that we want to work on and Sarah Lewis will work very well for this demo. So we click on her and then get resent into the app where it has all of this, where it's gotten all of this data from our server about Sarah Lewis. It has some observations and all and all of that kind and all of that kind of thing. So you can see that this that this works. Now I want to now what's nifty about this to, to me is Peter, can you go back to the OpenMRS instance? Uh, yeah, if you go into uh, system administration uh, and manage apps. So scroll and scroll down quite a bit <laughs> to this. Uh, so, so the uh, smart apps demo. This is how we added that little smart on fire button. And if you click on it, click on the edit. Yep. You can see that uh, so this this is the app configuration, but the one piece of configuration that's important here is ju just this launch URL, right? So this is the, this is actually what we pass when we you click on that button. This is actually where we where we redirect you to, and so it tell it tells it knows where the client is, and it tells it, okay, here's the fire server, and using only that that piece of information, the client is able to find 
our key cloak is able to find the fire instance and then our key cloak server and then go through this whole this whole flow. So th this is, I think, a really cool way of adding capabilities to, to OpenMRS. And it also demonstrates some of how we can make, we can use, leverage fire and some of the newer standards that it's built that it's built on top of to make these integrations a lot a lot more uh, seamless. Yeah. I, yeah. So, so I think I think the great summary is that like this would allow OpenMRS to act as kind of a standardized application platform for the family of like either patient facing or provider facing apps that are being generated that follow the smart on fire protocol. And these apps, you can. There are a couple of different um, app galleries that you can scroll through to at least see a subset of what's available. But this type of integration would allow us to much more easily run any of these types of apps on OpenMRS data, as if OpenMRS was this application platform. And, and, and one of the reasons it's cool to support this is not just one of the reasons it's good to support this is not just that you know it's it's kind of it's kind of nifty, but this is actually this is also the basis of a lot of uh, what uh, global organizations like the WHO are trying to build some uh, some of their more some of their computable care packages on top of these sort of frameworks and technologies. So we're hoping we're hoping to enable. Open MRS to take advantage of those things as they become available. As they become available, um, and I think Peter, if you can stop sharing your screen, I'll just go back to the uh, to the slides for one minute, um, just to show this very this very last slide, which has uh, the link for the link for our for the demo app that we showed, and then the source code where you can find all the little components for it. Um, and I should probably put these in the chat. So that's, that's, it for, that's it for this. Thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you very much, Ian and Peter. What an incredible future that opens. Well, next up, uh, speaking of speaking of helpful integrations, uh, we're going to hear from our COVID nineteen squad, and I will share the slide links again as well, so that all of these videos and links are available to everyone. So, uh, a bit of background about the COVID nineteen squad. Uh, a year ago, the COVID-19 squad was really focused on the initial response to the pandemic. So this included putting together a forms bank um, for COVID care and screening. It involved putting together uh, COVID thoughtful concepts to be used for data management. Um, but then uh, in the second half of last year, we switched our focus to DHIS2 because uh, obviously DHIS2 integration as we've seen earlier today is a key component of, of our care environments, but also because uh, it's a key component of COVID response. So I'm gonna uh, share a video from our amazing volunteer team members who've been working to improve the DHIS2 connector module. Some of you may have tried to use the DHIS2 connector module in the past and found that it didn't work. So we've taken that module, dusted it off and uh, substantially improved it so that it's now a working humming module and that you can, you can use it yourself if you'd like to. Uh, so I've actually got the video already loaded here. So let's go ahead and hear what's been going on. And welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Heishan and uh, this is a quick update and a demo on the recent DHIS uh, connector module development. And uh, we are gonna talk about the new implementations on the new uh, DHIS uh, period types and uh, previously our uh, DHIS connector module was only compatible with uh, three period types and uh, uh, those were uh, daily, weekly and monthly uh, but uh, with uh, recent development uh, we support uh, yearly financial April financial July, financial October, six monthly, and six monthly April, six uh, more uh, in addition to the uh, three period types uh, we had earlier. 
So uh, now my friend Puma will uh, take over and do a quick demo on uh, uh, how to use uh, six monthly uh, period types. Uh, uh, yeah, so yeah, Puma, you can take over now. Right, thank you, Sam. So I'm going to do a small demo using a six monthly data set. So I have created a data set with the six monthly period type, the media child type. And let's go to the media child character module. So here we have to create a mapping between the open mask report and the child data set. And we have to map the elements. I'm going to save it. The name. Now I am in the run report UI. In DHS connector module, there are two ways to push data to DHS to instance. One is run report and the other one is automation. So in run report, we can uh, push data instantly and uh, with automation, we can schedule the tasks. So I'm going to choose the report and the location. So before sending data, Let's see the data entry UI in the DHS2. So let's uh, select the data set and the period. Uh, here we can see there are no data in the data set. So I'm going to send data. Uh, so now we can see a success message. Let's see the data entry. Alright, now we can see the data in the data entry UI. Now let's see how the automation works. Let's go to the automation UI. So here we can uh, select the things for the automation. So I'm going to select this. And I'm going to submit this. After submitting, uh, this mapping will push data to the DHS2 instance automatically in the end of every 6 month period. I'll just run it manually. Then let's see in the data entry why in the DHS2. So we can see the data. So that's it and thank you. Back to you, Hesham. Thank you, Puma, for the nice demonstration. And uh, yeah, in the same way, you can uh, use any of these uh, nine period types to push uh, uh, data to DHIS2 instances and uh, using uh, uh, DHIS2 connect module, of course. and. Uh, yeah uh thank you everyone for listening uh goodbye amazing work hey sean pew mall we're so grateful to have you on the squad it's great to see the connector module working uh sending data automatically to dhis2 and setting it up to send it in a scheduled manner to dhis2 that's really great um, i'll post the link to the add-ons directory so that if anyone wants to uh, try out the new and approved DHIS2 connector module, it's there for you. All right, uh, so I'll just close this up here. So the next person I'd like to invite is uh, Dr. Jonathan Teich. Would you like to share a bit about what we're looking at now in the COVID squad about immunization history? Uh, sure, can you hear me okay? Yes, perfectly. Okay, good. So uh, let me just uh, share one piece here. Oh, if you if the other person unshares, I can share. There we go. And so, uh, as Grace said, I'm Jonathan Teich. I'm I'm a, a physician and, and in an emergency room and a medical informatics worker in Boston. And I've been a volunteer with OpenMRS since. 
about 2013, primarily on clinical architecture and on functional design. Um, so, uh, you know, we have seen uh, that COVID-19 has moved through several phases. And you can see my screen now, I presume? Um, yes. Let's so we've seen COVID-19 move through a number of phases as this very uh, rapidly developing uh, pandemic unfolds before our eyes. And the information needs have followed along as the pandemic itself has moved through its phases. So uh, initially it was about detecting the uh, symptoms and signs of a case and screening patients. Uh, as you've just seen, there's a lot of work on case reporting and understanding case counts. Uh, there's been work on both the vocabulary uh, as well as the forms necessary to capture some of the more novel treatments. Uh, and uh, now we're really in a phase where vaccination becomes uh, more and more a the key feature of, of the management and, and, uh, and address how we're addressing COVID-19. Um, and uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. And then beyond there, there's going to be a long period of syndromic surveillance when we need to look at our records, uh, use analytics such as the past squads have shown to be able to determine whether there are new pockets of COVID-19 disease popping up that need to be uh, addressed and eliminated before they can spread farther or generate new variants. Uh, so with regard to vaccination, uh, you know, there is uh, some, some countries are now well into their vaccination programs, uh, but many others are just starting or still awaiting supply, uh, but will be starting soon. And we know that for the next months and years, uh, we'll be continuing to do vaccinations, uh, particularly in uh, many of the countries that open MRS serves. Uh, so uh, the vaccination itself has its own workflow, uh, including the ability to uh, determine lists of patients who need vaccinations uh, and to be able to reach out to them, to be able to put out scheduling if you're doing a large scale vaccination program. Um, and then uh, we'll talk about the ones in bold in a moment about actually giving the vaccine, uh, giving the vaccine and actually reporting it out to uh, systems like DHIS2. And then also some things that are not quite clinical, such as being able to record and manage the supply chain of vaccination supply as it comes in to a national office and then to regional centers and then to places where it can be distributed. Uh, but uh, in terms of actually in individual dosing of a vaccine, uh, there's two pieces. One is capturing the fact that the vaccine's been administered, uh, and the second is recording it in the patient chart. Uh, so, uh, which is similar to what we've done with other immunization records, and we've used uh, PIH's immunization record as an example, but, uh, but it does have some unique features. Uh, so, uh, we know that vaccines being captured is being done through a number of mobile platforms right now. Uh, there are a number of, of uh, other mobile systems, not OpenMRS, that are capturing vaccines. Um, and that uh, DHIS2 is doing, uh, has some features to capture them. But we also anticipate that uh, as programs move forward, that we'll be capturing more actual vaccinations, most likely being done in hospitals and clinics that are using OpenMRS. Uh, so we've been looking into making sure that OpenMRS has the ability to both capture vaccine administration as well as to record vaccines in the patient's chart. Uh, so as I mentioned, vaccination for COVID-19 is similar to uh, as things you might get for a vaccination for, uh, for, for hepatitis or for measles uh, or for influenza uh, with some different features, uh, one being that uh, some vaccinations are a single dose, some are two dose, so you have to capture whether this is the first, second, and also whether this is the last dose for a given patient. It's important because there are several different manufacturers coming out with very different vaccines uh, to capture the vaccine manufacturer and the type of vaccine. Uh, and we anticipate that there may be second rounds from some of these manufacturers as they develop boosters or new kinds of vaccines or new formulations to handle some of the variants that are going on. Uh, so uh, a open MRS form to capture vaccine would have uh, the usual things, date and time, and then being able to capture this dose information, being able to capture the, uh, the location and organization where it was given, and then capturing the vaccine manufacturer and type for purposes of understanding the success and long-term results 
uh, as well as uh, things like lot number to capture potential adverse events or potential contamination if it gets reported. Um, so uh, we have been uh, we have designs for forms for vaccine capture using some of the uh, available uh, tools that we have in in OpenMRS sites or regular HTML forms. Uh, the data elements necessary for all of this are in CL. So uh, if you or your organization are interested in vaccine administration or capturing vaccine as part of an OpenMRS immunization record. Uh, then we invite you to join the squad meetings or post to the Slack channel. Uh, and uh, from that point, we can uh, gather your needs and perhaps uh, make you part of the workload. So that's all I have to say for this morning. Thanks very much. I have lost audio. I don't know if anyone else. No, you're back. Still here. Okay, I think uh, I, I'm having audio problems. I'm going to open it up to Jonathan. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Don't know if there's discussion. Going on. Okay, great. Uh, JJ, I'm going to hand it over to you to walk us through the great work that's been going on in the micro front end squad. Thanks, Grace. Um, um, I'm going to just give a, a very brief um, uh, overview of kind of the lo logging in and just showing you everybody a few features. Um, and then uh, we're going to show um, a video from Kieran Duffy, who's the UX designer we work with on this project um, of the upcoming feature with regards to patient lists. Um, so let me share my screen. Um, Um, so this is our demo site, um, and for those not familiar, it's at right now being hosted at openmrs-spa.org. Um, anybody's welcome to log in, mess around, add data, whatever you would like to do. Um, do not worry about it. Um, I think you'll notice right away that this is all a single page application. It is micro front ends, which means that it's many modules that are stitched together. So mo modules meaning um, uh, stored and um, maintained in different GitHub repositories, um, packaged separately, but then all brought together by our underlying um, framework. Um, and each kind of segment of the application, although you may not realize it as you're moving through is um, kind of its own bundle of code. So for example, this nav bar here is actually its own repo. Um, this home page here is its own repo and so forth. Um, the decisions about what goes into one repo versus another are more an art than a science um, and something that we kind of learn and decide uh, along the way. I'm just gonna briefly show you um, one feature that was recently developed um, with regards to the patient chart. Oops. Um, so this is kind of our standard um, landing page for right now. Um, in term, when you go to a patient chart, um, this is a d demo data that just comes with the demo server. Um, each one of these uh, cards that you see here are actually kind of what we call extensions. Um, and it's uh, another word that we basically use for a micro front end, meaning that these are um, bundled code uh, that are independently deployed and essentially separate from one another um, and have no dependencies outside of their own kind of patient chart context. Um, and then there are things that the framework provides so that this widget would know, for example, that John Wilson is the patient and that it's supposed to look for each of these forms to see if John Wilson had had one recently um, completed. Um, uh, the one new feature that I wanted to show you was a results viewer. Um, so we have a design process where we work with um, Kiran um, through multiple iterations, which include uh, uh, expert stakeholders, and then um, uh, 
then down to users as um, and then final iteration uh, and then hand off to the developers. Um, once it's ready for development, it goes to uh, Zeppelin. Um, so this is the um, designs that Kieran uh, had has created. The final work is or the, the the code is still in progress. I just want to give you a taste of what the designs looked like. Um, You'll notice, you know, in OpenMRS, we've never really had kind of a dedicated results viewer. Um, we see this um, as a kind of a first step towards a more generic chart search, um, but with a focus on uh, laboratory test values. Um, so right in these designs, you'll see that there we have kind of uh, panels um, and then the values uh, are displayed, displayed uh, uh, columns are time and rows are uh, la laboratory tests. Um, and just a few more of the designs. Um, and then I'm going to switch over now to the development. So this has been handed off. Um, this uh, recent results is kind of like a, a, a single column based view, which shows the most recent results um, uh, first. Um, some of this is mocked data, um, but um, uh, in this case, the CM chemistry panel is actual data stored in as observations in OpenMRS. Um, so if we click on the timeline, um, it then loads this. You'll see that this is still uh, kind of work in progress. There's still um, design related, um, or some of the designs are not um, completely uh, implemented yet, but it's at least the first step. Um, and it's a, it's a very nice view for being able to quickly kind of scroll through labs. Um, uh, so um, please feel free to check it out uh, at your leisure. Um, the next thing that I just want to see if I can show you, and hopefully this will work, is uh, the latest set of designs for patient lists. Um, Kiran made this video. So I'm going to play it and I'm going to hope that you can hear it. Um, if you can't, Grace, just let me know and hopefully we have a backup option in place to get this working. For sure. Hi everybody, Kieran here, the UX design lead with OpenMRS. And today I'd like to give you a preview of the patient lists feature, um, which is a feature we're currently testing um, with people um, in, in Kenya. Uh, and I'm going to display it on a seven inch tablet. There are two types of patient lists. There are my list, which are lists that you create and add patients to individually. And there are system lists. These are lists that are generated um, by the system based on certain um, criteria. But JJ, do you need to switch your focus on the uh, video? Say that again? Yeah, we we're, not, we're not seeing the video. We're seeing your sc the screen you just showed before. Ah, uh, hold on one second. So you have to change your sharing. Uh, it a, I'm going to move back then a few seconds so that you can at least see. that are generated um, by the system based on certain um, criteria. <laughs> so let's start by creating uh, a new list uh, and we can give it a, a name. We could also give it a description. And now I can choose which um, parts of uh, patient data will display in the list. So we could choose their name, probably their gender, maybe the phone number. Um, and once I click create list, then I'm notified that it's created and it will appear in this list of my lists. Um, I can search for lists within um, their categories. So if there's many system lists, I could search for, um, yeah, this list of patients which have an appointment today. So this is a generated list of patients who have uh, appointments today. Let's take a look at another um, type of system list, which is the lost follow-up list. Um, and I've actually already put it into my favorite list so that it will display at the top um, of this page. Um, and under the lost to follow up list, I can see uh, a list of patients and different properties related to those patients. So I can see their gender, their age, the last visit. Um, when I swipe on tablet, then I can see 
and their phone number. Probably I can toggle on some additional properties like their address or their location. Um, and for each patient then, if I click on their name, I'll open up um, a version of their patient chart. Um, but there's also a quick links um, uh, menu to allow me to jump to specific places within their chart. So if I'm an outreach worker, perhaps I'll want to immediately open up the outreach form or find their next of kin or contact details um, to, to try to trace this patient. Um, I can also filter this list to find um, patients with specific properties. So any of the columns that display here are filterable. And, and today I can just filter by gender, but of course could equally filter by their uh, last seen date range or by their age. Um, but today let's display the male patients. And now all patients with the male um, tag are displayed in the table and I can remove that filter by uh, removing the tag. Um, okay, let's take a look at um, how you add a patient to a list. And to do that, I'm going to jump to Tao Yi's um, patient chart. So within this patient chart, I'm on their summary page um, and I can see all of the summary information, recent results, um, what visit actions are recommended or, or completed. Um, but in the patient header at the top of the top of the screen, there are some actions that I can do for this patient um, and I can add them to a list. Um, and today I can add them to the oncology referrals list. So let's do that. And now I'm notified that they've been added to this list. When I look at all details of this patient, I can see a list of all of the lists that this patient is, um, is on. Um, from within a patient's chart, I can also open the patient lists section of the app as a kind of preview in a preview window. And to do that, I'll click on this button. Um, and this allows me to see all of the patient lists. Now I can search for the lost follow-up list uh, and open it up like this. So now I'm viewing this lost to follow-up list within Tao Yi's chart. So if I close it, I'm still back where I was in the patient summary um, page. And if I pull it back up again, it will remember the most recent list I had open. And I can still go back and see all of the lists um, or return and see all of the lost to follow-up patients. So what this allows me to do is to work through a list of patients um, and, and jump into their chart if necessary. So I can jump into Kenjo's chart um, and, and see his information here. And when I pull up the patient list viewer again, uh, I'll be back on the same uh, list that I was and I can jump into Taoyi's chart. So that's all I wanted to show today. I hope it's been an interesting preview uh, of the patient lists feature. Uh, and I'm looking forward to talking with you all again soon. Thanks. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, those are the kind of primary things we wanted to just briefly show today. Um, we normally meet actually this time at uh, 8 a.m. on Thursdays as a squad. Um, all are welcome to join. Um, the Thursday calls are more focused on um, technical discussions and for developers. Um, and then we have uh, uh, bi-weekly design sessions or sometimes weekly design sessions um, where we have more of a focus on new features that are being created with a highlight on designs that um, Kieran has uh, been working on. Um, so we look forward to um, a future collaboration with all of you. Um, and I guess the last thing is that Grace has put together quite a few um, very nice, oh, sorry, as Grace moves to the sides, I realize there's, there's one other screen that we wanted to show you. Um, this is really in a very, very early kind of stages, but this is something that Kieran has worked um, on to kind of showcase maybe what a landing page would look like. You know, the traditional ref app is that you have a, a, a several buttons which allow you to navigate to different places in the application. Um, and this is trying to take a more user centric perspective of what widgets might be displayed on uh, a landing page when you show up or when you log in on a, on a clinic day. Um, so just to give you a sense that we're trying to also not just think through kind of the feature parity that RefAb 2.0 already has, but also um, beginning to work towards new um, features for um, kind of point of care usage of, of OpenMRS. Um, so Grace, did you have anything else that you wanted to add?
No, that's great. Thanks so much, JJ. Okay, thanks everyone. Was there something you were saying that I'd put together that you also wanted to share? Oh, sorry, the the dev, the getting started guide. Um, this one, yes. So Grace and others have put together um, a very wonderful wiki page that provides a lot of information, both about what we're doing um, and then links to JIRA to figure out new tickets that you might want to take on, as well as all the design work. Um, so maybe the best place to get started is to take a look on this page. Amazing. Thanks so much, JJ. Really appreciate that walkthrough. That was really exciting. After so much hard work, it's really exciting to see everything come together in demos like this. And um, speaking of uh, getting people engaged and capacity building, since that was a major theme that we heard from people yesterday, I'm going to hand it over to Jen to talk about the Open MRS Academy squad. Yeah, thanks, Grace. Um, and you know, I just want to say that Antonio and Marina couldn't make it today. It got a bit late in their day, so they've kindly asked me to, to share what we've been working on in the last quarter. So the OpenMRS Academy squad is really about supporting the long-term sustainability of OpenMRS products and implementations by specifically creating OpenMRS academies that expand local capacity. And this could be raising, getting to know OpenMRS if somebody doesn't know what OpenMRS is. Um, also impl like implementations, how do you implement OpenMRS? And then how do you develop like a developer academy? So those are kind of the three academies that the squad originally um, conceptualized. And as many of you know, um, can you go to the next slide please? In the in September 2020, um, we actually piloted the first Open MRS Fundamentals Academy in Mozambique. So this last quarter, we really spent a lot of time integrating feedback from that pilot and from the community into the Open MRS Fundamentals Academy curriculum. Um, so then another major focus from for the quarter was figuring out how we package the Open MRS Fundamentals Academy curricula. And, and we started talking about how we package other OpenMRS learning resources as well. That became a part of the conversation. Um, in addition to that, uh, the squad started exploring potential sustainability strategies for OpenMRS academies. How do we support this effort going forward? How can we encourage new um, organizations and countries to use the, this curriculum um, and, and conduct an OpenMRS academy in their own setting? So we know that, like we heard yesterday, countries and organizations want to build open MRS awareness, development, and implementation capacity. And we've often, often heard that facilitators and individuals are looking for training materials and content to use in their courses and for their own professional development. So our aim is increasingly to try to make standard Open MRS Academy curricula and support available to organizations and countries interested in hosting an academy. Next slide, please. Um, we have a, a very quick video here and that, that kind of summarizes our discussion and some of our ideas around how we can make uh, materials available. So, um, and a lot of this is starting to show up on the wiki. So Grace, do you mind playing the, the, demo, the video? So this quarter, the Open MRS Academy squad started talking about different options for packaging and making the Fundamentals Academy material available. And a couple of things became clear through our discussions. One is that there's a variety of material that we can make available. Slides, videos, formal curricula, you have it. And that different people use these materials differently. New community members might be looking for specific learning resources that will help them learn and grow. Implementers might be looking for the Fundamentals course specifically so that they can deliver an Open MRS Academy in their setting. And then facilitators are often looking for particular content to integrate into their own course, so they don't need a full curriculum. And we realized that what we needed was to package our materials in a smart way that makes it easy for people to find the materials that best suit their needs. We had a lot of great ideas and we came up with three possible packages for facilitators and implementers. One of them on our wiki so far is the OpenMRS Academies. So this would essentially give you an overview of the different OpenMRS Academies, and it would make it easy for you to reach out to the 
to the Academy squad um, and access the squad support in tailoring the curriculum, um, engaging community subject matter experts and experienced facilitators, and possibly in the future even having a a checklist that would guide this whole process of how to deliver an OpenMRS Fundamentals Academy. The other package that we were talking about is an OpenMRS training library. And this could be similar to like the Open Educational Resource Commons. The idea is that we have a space that makes basic slides, assignments, readings, videos available to facilitators, curriculum developers, instructional designers, subject matters, matter experts. And instead of organizing them into a formal curriculum, we actually create folders on specific topics, and that's where all of the relevant materials and resources are filed. So this is a little bit more like an open um, curriculum or an open resource learning resource um, library. And we are very tentatively starting to create this in our OpenMRS training material library on the wiki. Um, finally, we wanted to think about how individual um, learners or um, people who want to do to drive their own professional development, we wanted to think about um, what, what a package could look like for them. And this idea was really inspired by the Google Tech Dev Guide um, and the work that has been happening with the OpenMRS fellows around updating our dev stages. So we thought that we could create a few different um, pathways for different professionals to follow based on their interests and their, and their stage, and that we might point them to different tutorials, videos, readings, coding questions, et cetera, et cetera. Great, thank you. Can you go to the next slide, Grace? So, so there we have those three options that we that we hit, um, and and we have the feedback from the community on the Fundamentals Academy. One one thing that we started to do is provide um, guidance to Nepal on how to adapt and conduct a Fundamentals Academy. So this is a great example of what we mean by hosting an academy. Um, Sanjay came to us and said. You know, we're interested in having open MRS days, doing an open MRS Academy, fundamental, Fundamentals Academy in Nepal. Um, we want to host the Academy and we want to use that curriculum. Can you help us? And the, the squad said, naturally, we, we would love to help you. Um, so, so we talked a little bit about um, through the materials and talked about how Nepal could adapt the, the Academy materials to, to the actual setting. Um, so that it has a little bit more meaning to the audience in, in Nepal. So that's a little bit about what we mean by, by hosting an academy. An organization could choose to kind of drive the organization and facilitation of the academy with the, with the support of the, of the academy squad. A little bit similar to what we do with meetings like our, our annual implementers meeting where there's a host country and, and the OpenMRS community provides support and co-hosts that with, with the, the organizers in country. So we're really hopeful that we, we will be able to um, get additional interest from countries or organizations interested in hosting the Fundamentals Academy. And we're open to providing um, support to them and guidance such, just like we did with Nepal. Um, but we're also interested, especially with, um, with, the, with what's been happening with the 3.0 framework, we're really interested in moving forward and, and kind of laying some of the foundations or the ground or doing some of the groundwork um, for an OpenMRS Developers Academy or an OpenMRS Implementers Academy that would, would, would really kind of build that capacity in these new areas with these new technologies that, we're, that we expect our community um, to be using moving forward. So we are looking for content experts, curriculum developers that can help us design um, those academies, contribute to the content, or in the future facilitate sessions, either remotely or in person for the developers academy or the uh, uh, implementers academy. We're also looking for implementations who are willing to conduct a fundamentals academy or help pilot a developer academy or an implementer academy. We're open to, to which one you want to focus on. 
And, we, and we're also looking for people who want to work with us on an OpenMRS Academy sustainability strat strategy. Our squad meets every, every other Thursday at 1 p.m. UTC. So uh, we were supposed to meet today. So in two weeks, we will have another squad meeting. Anybody and everyone is welcome to join us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen. Great to see those materials coming along. Well, over to the QA support team. I think uh, Christine or Kowasi, over to you. Uh, Christine, I see you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Hello. What about now? Can you there hear we me? go. Yep. Now we can hear you. All right. Sorry about that. So, um, so yes. So I was uh, just giving a brief, a brief background on the QA support team. So um, the QA support team is working on ensuring that uh, the community is able to release uh, quality open MRS products and with the focus which we started on with the reference application. So just a brief background is that we started off last year um, in the year 2019, whereby we look into a framework, found a framework, uh, started supporting the community in, uh, first of all, setting up a manual testing process, which is, that has been set up, uh, creating uh, documentations, processes, and now where we are at at this year is automation. And over that time, we have grown as a team. Uh, apart from just being the small team that has been over time, we've had other contributors come on board uh, in terms of volunteers and our and our, and our new fellows who are just joining us and um, I indicated them on our contribution page. So um, next page, please. Slide. Yes. So uh, with that said, uh, we are now moving away from having our uh, testing being done manual, but uh, now moving to having it uh, done uh, automating it. And so the focus of the quarter has been extending uh, our automated test portfolio. And then, of course, there is uh, large activities around capacity building and mentorship, given, given all the new members that have joined us. And uh, this is as a result of people hearing our of needing volunteers who can come and join our team. And uh, the pro uh, what we're trying to solve is um, we want to ensure that uh, we have uh, improved our test coverage as it regards to the reference application. And so that's what we're working on in terms of extending our automated test portfolio and, of course, strengthening our QA processes and our team. And this is happening through um, whereby we are onboarding new, uh, new uh, members, especially in terms of uh, from a dev perspective, who are coming on board and going through our documentation, learning, and then us, uh, setting up the QA framework and then starting to work on tickets, which are available or currently on our QA board. Uh, put the link on the side. And some of the milestones uh, since then is that we've had our team has grown. So before we used to be uh, like one QA engineer, but now we are, I can confidently say we are expanding up to around three, four uh, in the team. And of course we are having now, uh, before we were more of yeah, this is a demo of how Cucumber can work and uh, this is how it's possible to be done. But now we are having that uh, this is actively being uh, implemented uh, within as we're expanding our test coverage. And so we're still seeking more volunteers to come on board uh, to help write code, help in testing, help also in documentation, and of course, uh, becoming mentors, because what we'd like to ensure is that over time we are having, um, uh, we're having more and more people understanding, understanding uh, aspects of quality assurance, coming on board, uh, helping out in testing, and so that we're able to not just cover uh, just the reference application, but of course, other larger aspects of the different squads and teams that we currently have. Um, we meet every Tuesday at 4 p.m. UTC, and we meet on Zoom, and we're also on Slack. We also have a QA board currently that has a number of tasks under which we are working on, um, uh, whereby we're working on um, improving our, uh, automating our tests. So for all tests that are currently available, we are fixing any bugs. And for any features that so far have, uh, are not being, uh, that are not being tested, we are creating their automation test cases so that they're available. So in the next slide, we'll have, you'll see a demo from uh, one of our members within the QA support team, Kay Daoud, who recently joined us and has gone through the QA framework, studied it, and has been able to 
write and automate test cases. So he will take you through and Grace, you can play the video. Hi everyone, I am Daudi and I'm going to walk you through what the QS code is working on. Ideally, the team is working around ensuring quality within our modules for better performance of our software to the end users. Currently, we have two tests, the existing reference application tests which we are fixing to make sure we raise coverage and then we have the new tests that are being written using the BDD framework for every feature that is not tested at the moment. We are testing them in the BDD approach through QA framework module which is present on the repository and in this approach we trigger tests using either Cypress or Selenium to automate tests on the future functionality. Feature files are written for each feature which then translated into steps definition using either Selenium or Cypress. Working with QS code has helped me acquire and advance my skills in how to debug a test and how to write automated tests on the future and has also helped me to understand the OpenMRS modules and in this showcase I'm going to uh, illustrate how you can automate a test on a future and that is uh, let me log in into an online instance here when a user logs in and then clicks in find patient and then searches a patient by typing maybe Andy Peterson or oh sorry Andy Peterson yes clicks in the patient the system should be able to load so we are going to have uh, an automated test that is on allergy and we are going to look at the two scenarios so when the user clicks in uh, the allergies link the system should be able to load so the two scenarios that we are going to see automated that is uh, adding no known allergy when the user clicks in add no known allergy the system will be able to add and then the second scenario when the user wants to remove by clicking this the system should be able to remove the no known allergy and then uh, the steps definition for this test has already been written which contains uh, the allergies future and this allergies future contains the scenarios that are going to be run that is adding no known allergy and also removing no known allergy so these scenarios are wrapped in the steps definition and then we call this uh, steps in run test.java and then allow me go to and run this test directly navigate into the project and then type Marvin clean test and then watch uh, in the nutshell I've uh, set my headless to be false such that we can see what happens in the browser and the system should be able to automate this test it's running the test And so the system loads the online instance and then should be able to load find patient just as what we we saw but such as a patient under Peterson clicks in him loads the page then clicks wonderful that's the first test that has been automated then we are going to adding uh, rather removing the no known allergy from the allergies table so these are background steps that are 
run before each scenario, find patient, such as Andy Peterson, just it's automated test. It loads and it quits the browser. Wonderful! So that's an automated test and this is fun. Join the QA team to have fun and many more. Thank you for listening and watching. Great. Um, Hi, yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone. Sorry. So, yeah, um, that was uh, work that is being done by one of our volunteers. And uh, thank you for watching. So, Grace, back over to you. Thanks so much. Great to see those uh, automated tests coming back together. Um, I'll do, we've got only three more to go, guys, and then, um, and then we'll be diving in to some more discussions together. Uh, next is the PM team, the documentation team, and we'll wrap up with a bang with the new website reveal. So stay tuned. Uh, so the PM team, we get together every Monday and we go through a bunch of the stuff that kind of needs to get done or needs oversight in our kind of core community um, uh, software products. So uh, what do we actually do on Monday? Well, there are a couple key things that we do together every Monday. So first, we actually check um, for any failing builds. And so if you've been messaged by us where we're like, oh, we're a bit concerned, you know, your build seems to be failing. That's where this came from because we noticed it during our Monday review. Um, we also look through every single new ticket that anyone has filed in JIRA that hasn't seemed to have gotten any attention. So it's still unassigned, it's still to do. So we look at all of those. And so if you've noticed, we've been a bit more responsive lately by labeling tickets, prioritizing them, um, adding comments, trying to bring them to people's attention. Uh, that This is why. The other thing that we're doing is we, we look through any blockers. So any tickets that have been marked as a blocker, an intro ticket or a community priority ticket that needs attention either because it needs to be reviewed before it can be ready for work or because it's waiting for a code review. So for example, you can see that a week ago, we had 20 um, community priority tickets that were waiting for code review. So we would go through those just to make sure that someone was giving them attention and they weren't getting forgotten about. And that's, that's the PM team in a nutshell, the shortest uh, showcase today. But um, yeah, thanks everyone for being so responsive to us on JIRA. It's definitely making a difference. Our issue count and average age continues to go down. Four months ago, our average ticket age was I think about four years and now it's 1.8 years. So we're working towards keeping things uh, under a year old so that we can be a more responsive community. I'm gonna hand it over now to the documentation team. I believe, Kaylin, are you presenting? Yes. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay, Would you like I'm to share your screen? My screen. Yes. Looks good. Hello everyone, my name is Kayla Bracey. I'm from the United States and I'm actually new to the OpenMRS documentation team. So this is my first time meeting a lot of you. I'm pretty excited about that. So basically what the documentation team does is we ensure that proper documentation is available to all parties. We are consistently updating the wiki developer guide and volunteer guide. We have bi-weekly meetings on Tuesdays from 3 to 3.30 p.m. UTC time. But since my time zone is Eastern time, my, my meetings for me are for 10 a.m. So problems we're solving are how can we increase the visibility of what we're working on? So for the final quarter of 2020, 
some people were confused about what the documentation team was currently working on. So we want to improve on that. How can newcomers get started with the right information about projects? And so basically, so the first quarter of 2021 and currently in this quarter, we want to make sure that new people in the community are comfortable with contributing to documentation and not become overwhelmed. And finally, how can we keep our documentation up to date, which we're currently working on this quarter. So some achievements that we have so far this year are a new community member guide published on a wiki, a getting started guide with Michael Flinton's draft. And we also submitted our proposal for this year's Google season of docs on March 26. These are some of the screenshots from the new community member guide and the GSOC proposal, but I'll show the entire document. So this is the new community member guide that's published on the wiki. Basically has the basic information why you would want to join OpenMRS community about OpenMRS, you know, and the instructions on how to get started and how to contribute. And we also have information for the different teams and squads. And this is the draft for the micro front end. And as you can see, um, a few people have made comments, which is great about what we can um, change or edit. And then finally, we have the 2021 Google Season of Docs proposal. So basically, what OpenMRS is, our problem statement, and our solution. If I'm scrolling too fast, just let me know. I just wanted to show like a basic overview. So our focus, focus this quarter is improving the squad project pages. We would like consistency throughout the wiki, and we want to make sure each squad and team page has the accurate and appropriate, appropriate information. And we're also expanding the Getting Started Guide with potential support from Google Season of Docs. So if our project is approved by Google, we'll be working with a technical writer and some fellows on how to, on the Getting Started Guide for developers. And some of our milestones so far have been the Getting Started Guide template and samples. And we also have two new Getting Started Guides for target squads drafted and or published. So we're currently seeking technical writers, content experts from different teams or squads who are interested in helping or creating a Getting Started Guide. So if you guys are interested, you can always come to the documentation meetings or just contact one of us on the documentation team. And this is just an example of some of the team pages. So this is for the documentation team homepage. I made some edits a couple weeks ago. So basically you just have the description, the purpose and goals that we're working on and the agenda and some of the meeting notes, which you can see on the sidebar broken down by year. And then also is the meeting um, information and if you're looking to join. That's pretty much it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kaylin. It's been great having you come on board and shout out to uh, Grace Nakiguli as well, who's been leading the documentation team these last few months. Both of you have just been wonderful to work with. And um, if any of you follow our wiki pages, you'll probably have seen updates on quite a few of them as kaylin has been catching things and improving things throughout our documentation all over the map. Uh, so it's just awesome. All right, uh, so maybe Kaylin, if you don't mind um, stopping sharing your screen, then I'll hand things over to the website design squad for the last squad showcase of the, the mini conference. So handing it over to, I think, um, Jen and, and Burhan and Susanna. 
and and Cheyenne as well. Thanks, Grace. Um, yeah, I'm going to just quickly take us through. Um, well, Cheyenne and I are going to take us through, take you through what what has been happening with our website. So we have a small um, and yet mighty website design squad that for the last quarter has been working on redesigning our website to tell our incredible story in a compelling way for different audiences from stakeholders to potential community developers to new implementers. Um, we've started meeting every week at, on Wednesdays at 3 p.m. UTC. And um, really, I have to give a shout out to Susanna for, for kicking us off um, with our current round of work by putting up a, a beta draft website um, that we're going to take you through in, in just a second. Um, actually, not just like literally just a second. I'm going to share my screen and uh, Cheyenne, do you want to take us through the, the new the new landing page and website? Absolutely. Um, just a heads up, I'm outside right now, so you might hear some cars and some fire trucks passing by. <laughs> um, so we've been we've been working on this new website for a while and um, <clears throat> Primarily the need for the new website stemmed from um, the fact that the old website has been around for about 17 plus years with almost little, little to no big updates. And we wanted, to, we wanted to focus on some of the key aspects that the current website fails to express. So the current website obviously is well made, but it's well made for people who know what they're looking for. So experienced open source developers and users and just people who know what open MRS is about. It doesn't necessarily sometimes appeal to health ministries or the government or funders, which is a key demographic that the website aims to target. So um, the new website will be more simple, more user friendly, nicer looking, and um, the user flow would be much more enhanced and efficient. And we're using these mini structures called personas to build an effective um, user flow throughout the website. And in addition to that, some, some of the buttons in the old website are complicated to understand sometimes and work through, like the downloads button, for example, OpenMRS doesn't have a strict, you know, executable download. And sometimes that confuses people, including myself. When I was first joining OpenMRS, I was digging through the downloads page a few times before realizing that I have to set it up and choose one of the reference modules and stuff. And so the new website will, will focus on that uh, with really nice um, linear structures and people can just, um, we're, we're aiming to, if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see two buttons um, right there. So just really simple buttons like those to um, take users through, through a nicer looking user flow. And um, we don't want users to end on pages and dig through pages that they don't need to be on. So um, for example, funders don't need to necessarily go on the development page. Um, and so we want every user and every persona to have a user flow and to have a structure um, to land exactly where they need to be on the website. Uh, the, the Right now we're using this beta um, Soul Develop Foundation um, hosting site to, to test our beta, but we're soon, um, we're, we're, we're looking to move to the um, openmrs.beta, openmrsbeta.org. And so we're, we're gonna move all the production in-house. Um, and the theme we're using right now is Elementor on WordPress. I believe uh, right now the, the whole process is in um, the phase of transferring everything we've discussed in, in the design forums to now the live beta version. And hopefully, um, Jennifer might be able to talk more about it, but hopefully the next coming months, we can publish it live. Um, and we're uh, right now, the current milestone is finalizing the landing page, which is the one that you are seeing right now. We need to, um, most of the stuff has been done um, by the website squad, but we need to finalize it. and. And you know, make some slight changes like include the logo in the front, include the, the links and the buttons, and just have a nicer looking design. Um, maybe change the picture in the background. And um, we're seeking anybody with, with digital experience, so website, graphic, um, logo design. And we are now, I believe, open to the public for um, feedback. 
So we have mostly been uh, a closed feedback loop so far uh, in our Slack channel, but I think now we are open to a wider public feedback loop so we can get things moving forward. Um, and I will give it back to Jennifer. Thanks, thanks, Cheyenne. Yeah, just to give you a quick glimpse of, to, of what most of our most of our focus has been on um, the landing page. So we wanted to make it really quick and easy for people to go to the page that they they wanted to go to, whether it's looking at you know demos and getting to know our technology or finding out more about joining the community. Um, we also wanted to you know convey the impact that we're having um, and and communicate what our mission is. Um, so right here up front, we have two videos. One is um, the, this is OpenMRS video that, um, that we showed at our, our implementers meeting in December. And then we have a new, slightly longer, um, about nine, 10 minute video um, that really talks about OpenMRS, um, what it is, in a, and, and gives a much more of a almost technical overview. So that is a good second video to, for people to, to watch. Um, and then we wanna tell some stories. Um, you know, and we, we're trying to kind of have three different stories, one for um, stakeholders, one for implementers, one for developers, and then show um, people then how they can get involved, whether it's through development, implementation, growing their skills or coming to an event. Um, and then, and then telling people how to get support, recognizing um, in the future, our partners and financial supporters. And, and this is kind of the first landing page that we've been working on <clears throat> this quarter that will really define the, the, the subsequent work that we do on these other um, pages that, um, in, the, in the next quarter. So like we said, um, we're trying, we're, this, we're, we have this right now as a draft. Um, we've kind of identified some minimum content that we wanna make sure that we just get up. And then as soon as we have that minimum content um, on the landing page and then a few other pages, we wanna just make the site live and then um, keep improving from there. So we're excited about what we can do between now and our next um, community spring or fall community meeting, maybe in August and um, September. So we hope to have an even better update for you next time. Thank you. Thank you so much, website team, uh, that is, or squad, excuse me. That is just wonderful to see coming along. Uh, everyone's worked really hard on that. Well, that starts to wrap up our squad showcase uh, for the quarter. Now, if you've been watching all of this thinking, oh my goodness, there is a lot going on. There's so many different squads and sessions that they have every week. How could I possibly keep track of all of this? Don't worry, you're not alone. We feel like this all the time. <laughs> So here's the link to our open MRS events page. This is a calendar that's kept dynamically updated. We work really hard every day to check that the events are accurate and up to date. So use that link and it, you can also, um, this page will guide you how to integrate it with whatever calendar tool you are using. All right, let's wrap up with a vote. Let's vote for the showcase demo of the quarter. So go to menti.com and use this code, or you can go directly to the link that I've just now pasted in the chat. And what we'll do is I think um, we're going to take a break. Maybe Jennifer, should we allow people to vote during the break? And then when we come back, we'll unveil the winner. Yes. Vote during, during the break. Time to unveil our winner of the 2021 Spring Showcase. Here we go. I don't know what the results are going to be. And the Micro Front End Squad wins. Thank you so much to all of our participants. It was amazing having, seeing all of this work. It's just really inspiring and fulfilling.